All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Raymond, and I direct programs and membership here at WCET. Thank you so much for being part of this conversation. We have a great group of panelists today. I'm really excited about this conversation. As we go through, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box and feel free to engage with us in the chat, but try and keep your questions in the question box because sometimes we lose track of them if they are put into the chat box. Kim will drop in a link to the slide so you can follow along. And we will also share a link to the recording um, and any resources that were shared as follow-up. If you'd like to follow along on Twitter, the hashtag is WCET Webcast. We are grateful for our partnership with Learning Meet that helped pull this together for us, so thank you. And again, if you have any questions, enter them into the Q&A, and feel free to share resources and comments in the chat. We have a terrific moderator today, Jackie Rickards, who is the Transform Evangelist at Learning Meet. So she's going to moderate today, and I'll pass it off to her, and she'll introduce our speakers. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you so much, Megan. We're very, very glad to be here today. When I look at this group, I think, boy, we'll be able to help us think about what's next for online teaching and learning. You know, for higher education, there's no doubt that we all learned a lot last year. And between Terry and Shane and Shelley, I think this is a wonderful team that's thinking about how do we sustain what we learned, the gains, and build on those strong educational outcomes. And what we're going to be sharing today is how we can look at what was what do we really want to hold on to and share and make sure that we can reuse throughout our courses. So uh, I'm just so glad to be here today. My colleague Steve Ernst is in chat as well, and we're here to just help um, take the story of what National University did and then uh, hopefully um, have a great discussion about how it can be replicated at other WCET in, in institutions. But Terry, would you want to go first and say hello? I would be delighted. Hi, I'm Terry Heron. I'm the Director of Customized Education for uh, National Education Partners, and we work in partnership with the National University System, and I work specifically with our Workforce Education Solutions Department so that we can build these kinds of marvelous um, professional trainings that are related to our academic programs. Thank you. And Shane, would you mind saying hello next? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. My name is Shane Stroop. I am the Director of Curriculum and Instructional Design uh, within the Office of Strategy and Innovation at National University. Uh, and I currently oversee our team of instructional designers who um, work with our subject matter experts and our faculty members to create the amazing content that we have at National University. Excited to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Shane. Shelley, would you mind saying hello, too? Oh, absolutely. First of all, I'm thrilled to be here, and thank you for everybody that's tuning in. And um, joined the San Diego Police Department in 1982, uh, retired 35 years later as the chief of police and then joined National University, uh, focusing on public safety and other leadership curriculum. Thank you so much, Shelley. And this whole team between Terry, Shane, and Shelley, we're just so lucky because we're going to be telling the story now, thinking about how we saw this need. And you know, with Shelley and Terry's help, they won a grant and took this need for you know, to change this eight hour in-person training into high quality scenario based online training. And then we didn't just leave it there. We knew it was something wonderful. And now it's being reused throughout those NU courses. So um, I'll, I'll be moderating chat, but Shelly is going to lead us off and we'll be you know, excited to hear what everybody thinks. Please go ahead, Shelly. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Well, first of all, this project was a collaboration with many, which included Terry and Shane, who are going to be co-presenting here today. So let me just talk about how did National University uh, get this opportunity to develop online training for California police officers and professional staff? Well, we became aware of grants on five different policing topics offered by California Post. And POST stands for Police Officers Standards and Training. And although we were interested in applying for all five of the grants on the different topics, we learned about the grants well after that they had been announced. Therefore, there was an extremely short timeline of, quite frankly, less than a week, uh, which made that impossible to complete and submit 
five grants uh, in time. However, for two of the topics, one being on community policing and the other on organizational wellness, I had given several presentations while I was the chief of police on these topics, the city council and other entities. And I continue to speak on these topics even today. Uh, so I had a lot of material that the National University team could use to apply for these two grants. I will tell you is that everyone on the NU team hit the pause button on all their other projects. And in less than a week, we did submit the grant proposal, proposals on community policing and organizational wellness. The great news, we received both of the grants from post. The not so great news is that again, we had a very short timeline to develop the training. And this was going to occur during the holiday season, uh, pretty much just about a year ago from, from today as we had uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, New Year holidays coming up. So I'm gonna now focus uh, the majority of my remarks on how we developed the community policing curriculum. Let's face it, community policing is all about relationships. And I was not shy to use relationships that I had developed both inside and outside the police department to help us. And here's the reason is that, look, and I'm just one person. And although I, I might have 35 years law enforcement professional experience in many areas, again, I'm just one person with just my experiences. And there's a saying that I believe in is that if I'm the smartest person in the room, then I am definitely in the wrong room. So it's extremely important to develop training that would bring in a, a diverse array of opinions and experiences. So to do this, we held numerous lis listening sessions. The participants were police officers and community members from different areas of our state, different ranks within their departments, different ages of community leaders and members. We tried to get as many ethnicities, races, religions, gender, small and large represented community groups and departments as possible. Um, during the listening sessions, we told everybody, check your egos at the door. This isn't about any one individual, it's about what can we collectively do and share for the greater good. And we also had in these groups, those that were and had been very critical of policing because we wanted all voices. And there were several themes that emerged during the listening sessions, which helped us build the training. We also found, although it might have been said differently by the participants, but there was quite a, a bit of agreement that the number one barrier to community policing was the lack of communication or how we communicate with each other. There was also vast agreement that people wanted to live in a safe and thriving community. Here are just a, a, a couple of the comments that, that we heard. There is no us versus them. It's only us. No one calls the police because something good happened. When police officers respond, it's because something bad happened. Police officers take on the myriad of societal challenges and try to make things better. And this is a privilege and an honor to serve the public. We also assembled uh, a robust uh, cadre of subject matter experts and had numerous robust discussions uh, what topics that should be included and then how best to develop the authentic, timely and practical training with the learner coming away with more tools and resources to help them do their job better. So we kept this in mind is that we were developing statewide training. Let's face it, California is a very big state. It's the largest state with almost 40 million people. It is very diverse and has every area from urban to rural to agriculture, has the, the busiest land border crossing at its southern border here in San Diego. It also has very large police departments and very small police departments. So it was extremely important that the training would be beneficial for any size or where the police department was located within our state. It was a tremendous opportunity to bring this free training to the different departments for both their sworn and professional staff. The larger departments, well, they may have a training budget, but it's never enough. 
And quite frankly, the smaller departments often have a very small training budget or, or none at all. So there wasn't just one way, or, and there's never just one way to accomplish community policing. Quite frankly, there is every way. And that is how we approach the different training modules. From the listening tours and sessions, there was sharing of both good and bad encounters with police officers. And we asked the police officers and community members if they would be willing to be in a video uh, during different segments of the modules to share what they had discussed during the listening sessions. So, uh, and I will tell you, most of them agreed to do this. And so when we developed the scenario-based training on real events, and the learner could choose different options, the goal was that we wanted the learner to be a critical thinker and think through different outcomes and the unintended consequences of their choices. The reality is this, there isn't a perfect solution to all societal issues that police officers respond to and the challenges that they respond to, but you can make choices that help reduce the unintended consequences for better outcomes. As an example, and Terry I know will speak on this, is that we would spend a significant amount of time changing one or two words in the scenario choices. Because here's the reason, words matter. And to help de-escalate situations, word choice is critical. And we would have the same robust discussion on uh, visual slides that were used and to change out the visual slides to help better the outcomes of what we were trying to have the learner think about. Now the training program, we, we took a hybrid approach. And since policing is a 724, 365 day job, we needed something the learner could do at their own pace while working nights, weekends, split shifts, all shifts, all shifts, and even uh, between calls that they were responding to if need be. We then offered uh, numerous days and times to come together in a synchronous session with a, with a facilitator to discuss further what they had learned. And since the learner in this session would be with many others from throughout the different areas of our state, that really gave an opportunity to both learn and share with each other. I will tell you is that the comments about the training have been overwhelmingly positive, including one student who said it had been the best training that they had received. And I'll, I'll pause here in a second and end uh, with this, is that it is important to realize what was regarded as a best practice years ago, likely is not today. And what is regarded as a best practice today, likely won't be years from now. So this is why you must keep prove, uh, improving, innovating, and the importance of being a lifelong learner. So I'll pause right now and uh, let others uh, share. Thank you so much, Shelley. I can tell that your story is really resonating. You know, like what, what I so admire is you know, how you went, you, you, you took the extra time and effort that even with this compressed timeline to involve the community and make sure that you had diversity and a wide range of scenarios built up. And Terry, I, I know you're going to um, you know, build off of what Shelley shared. Thank you so much. Absolutely, absolutely. It was a pleasure and an honor to work with a group of subject matter experts and professionals in the field. And of course, the biggest issue was timeline. And I'm 100% sure that every single participant in this webinar is thinking, oh my goodness, yes, I understand. It has to be done right now. Um, and if I could have the next slide, please. Um, one of the biggest lessons that all of us have learned, and some of us have been in online learning for a long time. Some, some of us last year was our first shot at it. But the most important thing is always to consider this has always been an eight hour set up in person, people coming together. And that meant that there was always with the time crunch that we were facing. So they had very little time, almost no time to write the grants. And then once we won the grants, we had three months to build and pilot. And so there was always this idea and some of the SMEs, um, you know, sort of 
sort of raised this up and said, well, can we just do what we've, we've done? <laughs> and that is a valid question. And the truth is, as Shelley said, you know, what we've always done is not going to always be the best solution. And so having that as my, as my basis with the group and having that common understanding and language, you cannot just translate. It does not work, and we all know that. So um, a couple of questions would be, how do we make this really strong? How do we make this really relevant? And how do we prove that we've done what we said we would do? So we'll take the next slide, because um, in our rush to complete, <laughs> we often find we don't have a particularly lovely structure. Um, but we wanted something that would be future grounded. So, you know, for now, we had this very busy timeline, a lot of things going. We had two modules being built, two completely different groups of SMEs with very little crossover. Um, Shelley was a rock on both of them. I was so happy that she was on both of them. But everybody was all in to, to move from this, how do we get it done from now mindset, to really build something with a solid foundation, because we knew we wanted this to be really impactful, really useful across this nation state of California with all of the different groups uh, that Shelley mentioned before. And we didn't want to throw away our efforts. We were working so hard and very quickly, but we wanted it to be effective. And we wanted to remember that it wasn't just for the learners, it was also for I mean, everybody, right? So we wanted to be able to take this experience and build on it as well. So the learners were our central focus, but also how could we take this further? And we, we did an agile approach for very specific reasons so that we could continuously revise and review and revise, as Shelley said, so that everybody could bring their expertise to bear. And what that allowed us to do, if I could have the next slide, is really take a design-based research approach. So we were building as we went, we were testing as we went, we had the internal expertise, uh, and that is an agile approach as it is. And we were able to show our work and then revise it and then build a better element as we were going. And we were never afraid of failure. So if some piece failed, that was actually okay because we could take that and we could flip it. We could fail forward every time. And so there was an open and collaborative, as Shelley mentioned, feeling and spirit. And every time we came together, we had something at the end of that time together to move forward. So uh, we wanted to definitely be able to show our work. So to show our work, <laughs> let's have the next slide and we'll show you some pieces. Our solution in these three months were to take the pieces that we had. So we had these people who were willing to do these documentary style videos for us. We wanted to strategically place them, and they were from a wide variety of viewpoints. So you're seeing there not only somebody from the, the law enforcement area, but also a community leader. This is specifically our, our community policing uh, module. And then also scenarios, as Shelley was talking about, we deliberately front loaded the scenarios because of the conversations we were having. So rather than give people information, we put them into roles where they had to do something like what you're seeing, which is be the police chief after an officer involved shooting of an African American man in their city and answer questions. And because there are a lot of potentially right answers along those, that spectrum and a lot of potentially wrong answers. We made this as real as we could. So we really took in the information that Shelley and everybody was so gracious to share and then built these scenarios so that you could make an you could make an action happen that you thought was going to have a good result. It appeared okay and then blew up in your face. 
because that's real, that's authentic. And we were able to do that with the partnership of Learning Mate, who was willing to throw in with us. We threw the designs at them, they developed quickly, we tested, we tested, we tested, we revised as we went. But we also wanted an inclusive picture because we had such a wide variety of audience members. So we wanted this to be a holistic approach. And we also wanted people to be able to make maybe even serious mistakes in a low or no stakes environment because they never have that in their real job. There's never something that doesn't incur a consequence. We personalized it by using some of the elements of our learning management system, which is D2L Brightspace, which allows us even in a non-facilitated, and that's what this is primarily, online learning, followed up with the hybrid, which is a virtual, magnificent, a virtual community learning. So these sessions that finish the training is where everybody who has prepped with these sticky situations, these difficult scenarios, followed up by very rich content interactives, then get to come together and discuss larger issues and share out their individual experiences having been prepped in the online. And what we found, and I can give you some actual numbers, which people like, I like them too, because they allow us to prove we did what we said we would do. Each one of these modules starts with a pre-survey, just to, just to get an idea of where you feel you are as a learner on the spectrum of, I feel like I have the ability to utilize elements of community policing, or community policing improves uh, police community relations. Where are you on that spectrum? I feel I have the knowledge, tools, and resources to build community policing in my own agency. We took all those numbers and then we did a post survey and asked them exactly the same questions. Every single one of the pilot, which is what we definitely have, uh, responses were statistically significant and they all went into the positive range. The three that I can share with you are, I feel I have an ability to utilize elements of community policing increase just in the pilot, which was about 200 participants, plus our SME group, uh, increased by 10%. I feel I have the knowledge, tools, and resources to build community policing within my agency went up by 15%. And those same things, knowledge, tools, resources, to train others in my agency to build community policing up by 18%. So we can say that we made sure that people felt like they were being seen and were giving them the kinds of experiences that allowed them to take that journey of learning. And I'll, I'll have the next slide if you don't mind. So the result was a self-paced hybrid design, intentional learning experiences. We did make them bite-sized because we understand these people have limited time to prep ahead of the synchronous session. So everything was 15 minutes or fewer. And then that way, if they did get called away, we made sure that the system, the functionality, allowed them to come back where they were, restart if they wanted, but come back right where you are. And then that way, we allowed them to open the learning and be motivated to look wherever they wanted. So when they entered, they took their survey, that opened the entire class to them all of the training pieces, and that was not prescribed. They could go in and look at things in the order they want. Now that's a trickier design, but a holistic approach allowed us to do that. And as Shelley was saying, this is one of our community policing pilot participants who, who said, honestly, and without a doubt, it was one of the best trainings she had ever participated in on any topic. And because of the ways that we use the learning management system coupled with this really beautiful collaborative approach to design, 
we were lucky enough to win one of the excellence awards. And uh, we're actually going to be doing a panel uh, for just those award winners through D2L next, next week to share uh, our experiences and what our projects are. And as important as this project is, and as fast as we built it, we had tremendously stable, foundational, and useful and impactful, I will continue to use descriptors, learning pieces, actual artifacts that are extractable if we need to. And we design those very specifically so they could potentially be remixed and reused, but it was also the process. And for that, I'm gonna hand off to my dear colleague, Shane, to continue. Thank you, Terry. great job. Uh, next slide, please. So really one of the questions that comes up is how does N NU and, and West, the training-based experience influence the university system at large? And so what we're trying to do at National University System, which includes National University um, and uh, a couple of other universities within that system, what we're really trying to take a closer look at is the idea of reusability and remixability of course learning objects and artifacts. So those bite-sized pieces that Terry spoke about earlier are, are things that we're really taking a look at and seeing where we can reuse that piece of content, um, potentially in another course, another um, training opportunity for our students uh, as, as we're creating new and revising older um, courses as we go through and do that. Uh, the first thing we need to do though is to make sure that we, we pair an amazing instructional designer like Terry uh, with a subject matter expert um, who has modern, professionally developed, professionally relevant uh, understanding of a given topic. And so in this case, uh, those are the police officers and the community leaders uh, that, that Shelly and Terry spoke about. Uh, and, and collaborating, uh, allowing them to collaborate in a way that will produce exceptional learning experiences for the learner. Um, often this really involves, and this is something that Terry spoke about earlier, but it involves creating those really rich um, uh, scenario-based experiences that students can, uh, can digest um, as they're in, in an asynchronous fashion, uh, but it allows them to really go through those rich pieces of content that are thought-provoking scenarios and, and, and look at them through the lens of real life experiences. Again, these are coming to us from, uh, from community leaders and police officers who have been involved in these experiences uh, throughout their careers. So as we're creating the, that amazing content for our students, we're, we're continuously designing for reuse and remixability in mind so that we could potentially use that piece of content in another area at some point. Uh, so, for example, if we're, if we're trying to create a, 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 an amazing video that's designed to show the basics of creating SMART goals that we plan to use in a marketing course, we may be able to also reuse that same video in another one of our courses that also requires the creation of SMART goals. So, really, in our mind, there's no need to recreate the wheel every single time unless it's absolutely necessary. Obviously, we want to make sure that that content fits and it's applicable to uh, the other areas that we're trying to use it in. But if we've got something there that might work in another area, we want to take that piece of content uh, and, and use it uh, somewhere else. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do here is take that, that information that we've created for these, um, uh, for these police officers in their training and see how we can reuse them in our criminal justice courses or even somewhere else throughout our university. Um, and so we talk about uh, the the atmosphere that fosters sharing. And so from our perspective, artifact reuse is really easy. Um, if everyone's open and willing to share across courses and with different colleagues, um, that makes it really, really easy to be able to share this content because we need to have that agreement across the board. Everyone who's involved with the creation of that content needs to agree that um, another this piece of content is applicable and could be reused in another area. But our mindset is really that great learning and uh, learning design and development is a team sport. And we should all be willing to share what we know and what we've created. Uh, and that's the open and collaborative spirit that, that Terry spoke about earlier. So um, really, again, in, in our mind, if a bite-sized piece of content is well-made, it meets specific learning objectives. I know that was one of the questions in the chat, but if it meets specific learning objectives, 
and can be useful in another course, why not share it? Uh, why not use that piece of content that we know is really well designed and developed with an instructional designer, an amazing subject matter expert? Why not use that in another area if it's applicable? So we're really trying to foster that collaboration and that mindset at National University by designing um, our, our courses for reuse and remixability and starting to use uh, or we're starting to utilize the learning object repository within our D2L Brightspace uh, learning management system to assist with the storage of these items uh, so they're easy, easily identifiable uh, when we're looking for something in the future that might be useful in another course. So um, that's how we, we take that those bite-sized pieces of, of content, uh, really look at them uh, through a different lens uh, for that reuse and remixability piece as we're designing um, and, then, and then storing them in a way that we can find them easily in the future. Shane, you're getting lots of comments and Shelly and uh, Shelly and Terry got lots as well. Uh, people like your guitars for sure. Now, Shane, on, for that last screen, Megan, um, you know, some of those materials, and please stop me if I'm wrong, that, that, that um, you know, from that last screen, Megan, like uh, when Shane was showing uh, like the rubrics, et cetera, thank you so much. You know, some of these are, you know, it's the same material throughout your whole institution, right, Shane? Like that, that one rubric or your learning outcomes map, et cetera. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Some of those, some of those, sorry, Jackie, some of those items are uh, very similar across the board in many of our different courses, especially when you start to look at our general education curriculum. A lot of those learning outcomes that we expect of students uh, throughout those general education courses are very, very similar. So there's right. e even a bigger opportunity in some of those, those classes and those opportunity or those items, an opportunity to share across different courses. Amazing. And then when I think about I love how you talk and you know, boy, this is really showing real world practice examples. You know, how, how might you, you know, take that one material? So you mentioned you're, you're using that, that, that learning repository with, within your LMS. Now, e even if a different university doesn't have that same repository, when you know, you know, your, your colleagues have put all this time and, it, and it's clear that from that data that Terry's talking about, it's working, how might you encourage that sharing? I, I really admire how your group works together. Yeah, that's a great question, Terry, or Jackie. So you're, you're talking about the sharing kind of between National University and mm -hmm. some of our affiliates, North Central University, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great question. Uh, so we haven't actually really uh, dove too too deep into that. We're we're in the process of, of going through a, a merger uh, of these two universities, and so we haven't had the opportunity really to be to share across those platforms at this point. So it's 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 a little tough to speak to that um, as it goes across two different universities. But it's definitely something that we will start to encourage more. Mm -hmm. uh, of our faculty. And I know there's a, a question in there about allowing content to be used. That's, mm -hmm. Terry speaks very great about this, this yes. piece of it, because uh, th that's really, really important is getting that agreement uh, mm -hmm. for that content to be used. So feel free, Terry. Yeah, well, I was going to start by saying that Wes, I have been very, very lucky. Uh, so let me start with gratitude. I am so grateful to have been brought in for Workforce Education uh, Solutions because although that is a national university system um, endeavor, it pulls people from a lot of different areas. So I work for National Education Partners. I serve Wes. And Wes has really become kind of a proving ground for this area because we're small, because we're, we're looking at professionally relevant elements. We're looking at this hybrid of, of uh, training slash academic um, educational design. And because we have built... Um, because we've built relationships. And I think that's, I think that's the key, just like Shelley was talking about, you know, you've built these relationships, relationship building is key. I will tell you that my background was not in learning design. I ended up in a very strange place. I started off as a faculty member at a very small, we used to refer to ourselves as the, as the bastard child of the state system of Mississippi. Uh, I worked at Delta State University, Gokra. Um, 
<laughs> and um, there was no money and there was ostensibly no help. And yet I was just handed this online course to build in the department in which I was working. And so what I realized right away is I had some skills, but I didn't have all the skills I needed. And so what I did was I reached out to my network, as Shelly was saying, right? If I'm the smartest person in the room, I need to find another room because there are all sorts of skills and things I don't have or know. Um, so really, first of all, being very open. That's really key. Be completely open about what your, what your end game is. And if your end game is we all will benefit from this and and this is important. And I, I noticed that, uh, I think it was Vanessa, if I gotten your name wrong, I'm so sorry. Uh, what you said was your tenured faculty. And that is the key, right? So a lot of us are, it is Vanessa, thank goodness. Um, a lot of us are coming from these very traditional models of, of on-ground academic institutions where credit counts toward tenure. And so what if we do this in this marvelous, you know, kumbaya, Pollyanna, I'm sure I could think of other things that your, your faculty will be thinking, well, yeah, kumbaya, Pollyanna, it'll all work out great for everybody. But when do I get credit for this, right? If you're going to use my thing that I built, I need to have credit for this. And there's a lot of this ownership and that is important and we need to honor that. So we need to balance our end game of everybody wins and the originator of the content is acknowledged so that if I do something truly miraculous, right? So let's say I was the tenured faculty member and I built a D2L excellence award-winning course, I should get acknowledgement and credit for that because it's important. At the same time, as Shelley was saying, you have to, if you are truly going to serve, you have to be willing to be generous. And that's hard. So first of all, know what your strategy is and get buy-in immediately. And if people do not want to buy in, then they lose out. And as others start to win with the buy-in, it oftentimes is self-correcting because people don't want to be on the outside looking in at the great party where everybody's getting better things and everybody is succeeding and they're still on their own. Being on your own is very scary. Uh, being in the midst of a group where you can collaborate and encourage each other. And then you also have that network where you can do things like pseudo pilots, right? So share your course and say, hey, Shane, um, you're in my department. I, I want you to look at this. And people will start looking at other people's things. But it is hard to change people's minds. And that has to come from the top and the bottom. So you can't just talk about... Um, this is what the Dean said, so this is how it is, because we both know that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, and it is really, really important. Yeah, I get you, Vanessa, being published, publish or perish, preach it, I completely understand. And so intellectual property is one thing, right? And let's say, if you're going to be publishing this thing, the other thing you can do is Creative Commons licensing, right? Yeah. Even in the smaller, even in the smaller areas, um, even in the smaller institutions, you have then published that, and that becomes a piece that somebody else can use in their class. So it, although it is open, it still belongs to you, and you can then show how many people are using your thing, which became very important. So while we are coming from a very open, 
collaborative, strategic kind of approach, when you're coming from the other side and it isn't really programmed in, remember there are those Creative Commons licensing pieces and you can build that into your strategy so that I own it and 60 people are using my freely available piece that I have built and it is showing results across the board. You know, publication, none of us in the academic area who have published, me included, ever think we're going to see a dime from that anyway. What we get is that we've published. So use those strategies. And then, Shelly, I would love to hear from, from the academic faculty side of things what you think. Yeah, you you know both you and Shane said that said that very well. It's uh you know you talk about the culture and you know it goes back to community policing. What's the culture of a police department? What's the what's the culture of, of academic? Um, and and it all goes back to and that's why I said in my earlier remarks is that it's a privilege, it's an honor to serve. You know to be a servant leader to go out and and you know I'll just give San Diego Police Department as an example is that. You know, the department receives about 1.4 million calls into their communication center every year. As I said, nobody calls the police department for good things. So when you respond to this, how powerful is that, that you have an opportunity multiple times a day to make a positive difference in someone's life and usually at their worst possible moment? So then how do we, you know, as I said, check the ego at the door. How do we get people to buy in to tell their stories. Because during the listening session, there was some amazing, wonderful, um, you know, heartfelt that, that community members and police officers were pouring out their hearts on real life events when you did respond to these calls, which would be incredibly impactful uh, to help the learner across our state uh, understand how best to go about, um, you know, the different entities and as we respond, as I said, to the myriad of society struggles. So taking a, that approach is that there was quite a bit of buy-in. As I said, the majority of the community members and, and police officers who we did approach to be part of the, the videos and to, uh, to assist they were eager to do it or just needed a little bit of nudging and, 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 you know, just to understand really what we were doing. And, you know, you put yourself out there and, you know, it was a, a, a story that was very personal to you, but you put yourself out there now for everyone else to, to see it and, and talk about it and take it apart. So, you know, I think with the approach that it is for the greater good, you know, is in incredibly important. And, and that's why they wanted to get involved in this from the beginning. And, um, you know, I think, uh, again, you know, if we continue to, to get these grants from Post or other entities, you know, I think we've learned a lot in this process and we'll take what we've learned that worked and, you know, and, and enhance it uh, to move forward. So, yeah, I agree with you 100%. You got to gotta get that buy-in. I love it, Shelley. So to me, what what Shelly and Terry just shared is a little bit of that difference that we're seeing the conversation in the chat where we know that, of course, publishing an article or a uh, you know, book you know, allows you to show your leadership in the field. But Shelly, like if, if you like you have 35 years in the field and we could not have done this collaborative project without you. But, you know, like any one person couldn't have done this project. It took a team of Oh gosh, 50 people working together, you know, for the intense timeline. And, you know, to me, you know, by all of us being honest and saying, we, we, we can't do it, you know, for ourselves, Th thinking back to some of these great questions in chat, the only way we're going to really, you know, get to that next level for online teaching and learning goals is if we think about those bite-sized segments like Terry led us in, and we take your, Shelly, your, you know, real world experience, and how do we bring that together in order to help, just like Shane shared with the reuse, you know, it's, different than like publishing one academic article. Um, please jump in, Shelly, Shane, Terry. Yeah, it's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, just to follow up, great, great point, Jackie, is that, you know, the, the goal too was to reduce or quite frankly eliminate all barriers to learning, okay? So we wanted to, to eliminate that. So what is the barrier for helping others come away with something that's going to improve not just how they approach their job, but for the greater good 
of, of the community. So we have to do everything that we can to eliminate those barriers. And, you know, as we say, just because you've done it like this 10 times before, no, we, we don't necessarily are going to be able to do this. We need to develop what we need to develop for the learner. Um, and I think that that was very important. And again, the learners come from different experiences, big departments, small departments, and you know, community policing, here, here's the reality in, in policing in general. It's not, uh, as I say, if you're going to have a critical incident that you're going to need everyone working together and have those relationships develop. It's when you have that critical incident. So how can we develop this to let the learner know that, that it's imperative that you have these relationships and that you do everything that you can to continue to make progress. Because again, what, what is best practice today, you know, several years from now is not going to be best practice. So we have to continue to work with what we do every single day and get better at it every single day. You know, not, it's not necessarily perfection, but it's progress every day. Oh, it, that, that is so beautiful. And, and again, related to what we what we were talking about earlier specifically to how how design works so thinking about you know you you often find yourself in these situations where something has to be developed really really quickly it has to be done as well as you can do it and you may or may not have the have the skills and knowledge to do it by yourself and yet that is the call um, and then also thinking about how we can parlay all that quick and good work into something that you're going to get an additional product from. So I'm still thinking about, you know, uh, my intellectual property and, and publish or perish because that's still very much ingrained in me, even though I've sort of left that world and flipped to the other side. It is something that's always in my head. And what I can say is, especially with something like design-based research, and I highly recommend it as an approach, because what it does is it bakes into the process that you're already doing this opportunity to not only get a better learning experience for the learners and the facilitator, your faculty will have a better experience because a better design is a better design for everyone, but the secondary portion of that is the research portion. And if you are already doing everything that you are doing, why not take that experience as a research approach and write an article? Why wouldn't you do that? You're already doing all the hard work. And even if it's a short article, it can show the different approaches that were taken and how that evolved over time. And people love to see, they love to see the numbers, right? We all love the, the quantitative, but we all know as faculty members, facilitators, and educators that the qualitative aspect of it, so having actually taught it, you will then have a, an additional opportunity, especially at a smaller institution where you may teach the same thing over and over and you're going to tweak it each time. You could have over the course of just one academic year, very rich research, very rich data that you can then parlay into a publication for yourself, even if you're giving away pieces of your design, right? So it's my IP. I put a Creative Commons license on it and then I give it away and I say, here's a great thing. Or I take it to one of the open educational resources platforms like Merlot and I say, please use this. And then I see the data on that as well. So then I can see not only my class, but the individual pieces. And that gives you sometimes not just double, but sometimes triple bang for your buck. Well, and if we're if we're going to work that hard, let's let's get as much out of it as we can. Oh, Terry, I, I enjoy working with you for ten reasons. But what Terry just shared, I mean, to be honest, we we didn't have time to do that last year, right? You know, we were falling over because of the needs from our online classes. But the reason I was so glad to partner with WCET to have this session today with you know Terry, Sh Shane, and Shelley was that you know this group, you know, the NU the NEWS group managed to do that because of these grant requirements. 
you were forced to. And in a perfect world, when we're not falling over from the online learning needs, you know, the more we can do that, you know, doing that publication, it, you know, it forces us to be more formal with whether we try and accomplish and how can we evaluate it. Um, I love how you talk about that, Terry. Do, do you want to share anything else or Shane too? Just don't be scared. If we, if we start from a position of fear, and this was for community policing too, we talked about this a lot, didn't we, Shelly? If you start <laughs> afraid, you will always do the wrong thing. <laughs> Right. Now, we, all, we, made, yeah, we made sure the scenarios were real scary. Life. Yeah. And, you know, but it's reality. And, and you know, I'm going right. you know, to say it's scary, but it's reality. And it's, you know, it, it's got to be authentic. And, and I think that's what the learner took away is that, wow, you didn't, you didn't shy away from anything. You know, these are, these are things could, could happen multiple times right. a day. And, and yeah. thank you. Yeah, exactly. So, when you start this, um, you can, you truly can bake in those protections for your own intellectual property. Um, oh, thanks, Vanessa. That makes me feel great. Thank you for the chat. Um, I think that, I think the most important thing is start with a plan that's going to create the best learning experiences that you want and then find a way to bake into that. Think about it at least. How can this be more than just this one thing? Because it's going to have multiple parts, it's going to have multiple inputs, and it's going to be important not just to you but to all the learners who go through it and not just them but your colleagues who can, even if they don't benefit from actual artifacts, can benefit from the process. So you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be. That would be my advice. Be fearless. Oh, this is a tempting note to end on. I love that quote. Now, now Megan or Kim, it, is there anything else that that you think would, would help the WCET members? Or do you have any questions? We admire you. Gosh, it is really hard to try and think of anything that would top what Terry just said. And I'm thinking about how if you lead from a place of fear or endeavor from a place of fear, you're, you're not going to end where you want to be anyway. So that's, that applies across the board in many aspects of my life, including parenting. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, I don't have anything else, and I'm just going to glance through the chat here. I think we covered a lot. So I'll go ahead and um, do our final wrap-up, if you're okay with that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for being here today and participating. WCET has worked very, very hard and launched our new website last week. We're very proud of it. So visit our website, wcet.witchy.edu, and it has many, many wonderful features, including a search that works very well. So we're happy about that. And you can see who our members are by our filterable list too. So congrats to our team for launching that. That was a big endeavor. Again, the webcast was recorded. We'll send a link out and you can always access our previous webcast on our website. Huge thank you to our sponsors that underwrite much of our work here at WCET. We couldn't do much without them and our supporting members, Colorado State University, Michigan State University, and the University of Florida. Next week, we have um, a great conversation on the future of online learning leadership. And this panel will talk about really what are some of the new challenges and how do we tackle those challenges as this, in, this challenging time continues to be dynamic. And, they will also talk about what it looks like to manage remote teams, which I know we're all grappling with right now. So join us for that. That is free and open to everybody, so you don't have to be a member. Our annual meeting is coming up on November 2nd, and that's a virtual event, but don't, don't fear. It will be interactive and very valuable. So I just want to take a moment to thank you all for being here, and thank you, Jackie, Sheen, Terry, and um, Steve for helping us put this together. So thank you again. Uh, and and Shelly, last but not least, Shelly, you disappeared. So thank you, everybody. We'll see you on the next WCET event. Take care.